After 10 years of blood, sweat and tears, you finally get all three mission stars. The hard work paid off. Good for that. Then, one day a retail startup opens using the same name as your restaurant. They specialize in clothing and bedding, and many reviews are not good. Soon, you are getting phone calls from their customers, and return packages start showing up at your restaurant. What do you do? Today, we visit a restaurant fighting for control of the name on which they built a reputation for 20 years. Oh. That name is Quinn. Good morning, YouTube. We are back once again. What's good, YouTube? Hi, guys. We're back. It's this is uh, Rye Guy. My, my name's Ryan. That's Chef Nino right there. Um, love ya. Love you. Love you more. Uh, we are back. Studio B21 is our name. Reacting is our game. And we are bringing back to our roots. Uh, we do love sports. We do love trying to find stuff to video game niche react video. to all that however food is our background mm. and we had a, a couple of years uh, around the block about couple around the block you know, in a nice in nice restaurants and all that together uh kind of a package deal me and me and i know where wherever we went we both we, we both worked because we work well together and yeah we, you find a lot of good people when you work in the restaurant industry yeah and, I'm uh, fortunate enough to keep in contact with some of them and this keep them in them. keep them in your lives, you know. A hundred percent. Once you find that, hold on to that, mm. you know. And you know. And we have been uploading a couple videos from a certain channel called Alexander Guest. He is a very affluent restaurateur from Europe who dines a lot at three Michelin star restaurants in my one of my theories was he was like a Michelin inspector but I don't think it's true because he has his own place conflict of interest all that stuff but just the way he describes stuff it makes me feel like he could be one of those people and it's nice to hear from like an experienced mouth of the industry like what's good and what's bad not some influencer trying to get quick big views on like or, or just like an echo chamber of like oh this is so good this yeah. is so good we don't know he might not like some of it and he'll say it that's the thing yeah we're blind we're blind reacting to this so, video, so yeah here we go menu title 390 dollar american menu so let's say 520 at today's exchange rate 540 mm -hmm. Give or take. 540 exchange rate so a $540 per person meal in California, so... What did he say? We are back for the new restaurant of the new series, where I visit California's best restaurants. Five days, five restaurants, each with three Michelin stars. Do not miss any action, make sure you hit subscribe. And if you have subscribed already, thank you so much. And now let's all go. Speaking of subscribing, don't be afraid to hit that subscribe button for us. If you really like the stuff you're seeing, um, five restaurants in California. I've seen one. I've seen the other two. This is part three. He went to Atelier Kren, which Dominique Kren's, which was featured on Chef's Table on Netflix. Oh, nice. Moderate. It was okay. Uh, Single Thread was the second restaurant, and he absolutely. It was almost perfection. Mm. Like it was amazing to see, and I have seen that restaurant on YouTube. I believe under the Eater channel, uh, they have a mise en place where they went to multiple Michelin star restaurants and watched like the preparation of like the dishes and like the service in general, like getting ready for the day and all that. So single thread, very much like they have their own garden, like out back and all that. Like they almost have zero supplies except for meat and all that, mm -hmm. right? So all their vegetables are their own. Oh, nice. So it's I one of those that. places. Like the wife is a gardener, like professional gardener and all that. So it's amazing to see. So I'm really, I think I might've actually seen this place. Correct me if I'm wrong. Any of our female viewers that you guys might know, the Try Guys, very popular YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. uh, the people used to be for Buzzfeed. They, one of their people, Keith, doesn't eat the menu. And I believe he didn't eat the menu at Quint's okay. for a three Michelin star, because he went green star, one star, two star, three star. Mm. He ate the entire menu. Really? Yeah. Wow. So that, cool. that might actually be one thing we 
can do another time as well. Like go over that. Like from, that sounds awesome. We should like, do that. We should. I think that's a great idea. Uh, my hopes for this series, maybe it's just a personal hope for me. I hope he does the French Laundry. Yeah, Thomas the Keller. The institution of the French Laundry. Yes. God's playground, essentially. He he was around when the whole Food Network was coming out, yeah. where. He was the most influential one where he brought modern food culture to the mass. Shout out The Bear as mm-hmm. well. Season three, they're, they've done some filming over at the French Laundry yes, for when exactly. Jeremy Allen White or Carmi was staging there. We, I recommend it wholeheartedly. Like Recommend The Bear wholeheartedly. Like be 90% a- of it is like, I've lived. Yeah. You and know? you have to be living under a rock to not have heard of it. Be but you. yeah, go go watch that show. We might just do uh, just a watch along with it. To try to like relive the PTSD. Good lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. San Francisco. We arrive at the neighborhood known as Jackson Square, full of older charm and modern sophistication. It's here where we find beautifully preserved architecture, cobblestone streets, and our restaurant for today, Queens. The historic building dates back to the early 20th century with classic brick and huge windows. From the sidewalk, you have a clear view of the kitchen, which makes the chefs inside look almost like street performers. Once we answer, however, we see that everything is brand new. Queens did a major redesign in 2023, which highlights the connection between the restaurant and the farm, where they get most of their organic ingredients. The tapers are spaced far apart to create a more intimate atmosphere and the earthy, warm tones of natural materials are chosen to remind you of nature. To create this beautiful space, the owners turn to very spaced architect Diego Delgado Elias. Our first bites arrive as I'm looking through the impressive finest. And this is the champagne, of course. He's, this guy is a massive champagne head. I wish I had the money to blow that he did on like all the champagnes that he buys. What's that be? Market value or and no no vintage? No vintage, yeah, you're correct. More, maybe multiple vintage vintages put together. Mm. Yeah. Could be that. Presente Jack Salos Millesin that I tried in our very first episode at Amper Alexander Martia. There it was a deal at 540 euros. Here it is more than eight times that price. Proving that location is everything. And you need to strike when the iron is hot. Uh this goes back to my LCBO yeah, thing we, when we were just speaking about we, the wine. We recently did a video on... If you want to see it, it's over here. The Liquor Control Board of Ontario is on strike, and that is our that is our province in Canada's number only real supplier of hard liquor. It's the number one buyer of alcohol in the world, by the way. And government mandated as well. I yes. Believe. We talked in that video about how restaurants can increase bottle prices like without without giving any details without why. any explanation and the reason why is people don't know why and this people is, get confused about why this is actually a perfect example yes. like from a 500 dollar from a 500 euro bottle which is roughly 800 dollars 800 bucks 800 bucks mm-hmm. canadian to and that was over in somewhere in europe where he was mm-hmm. uh to a five to it the same bottle same vintage probably same, same bottle same year being five thousand American dollars, aka like sixty five hundred Canadian dollars in today's economy. Mm-hmm. Here, I decide to go another way with a wine pairing. There are two options: a classic pairing for two hundred and seventy euros, and a rare wine pairing for four hundred. The mm-hmm. second one excites me more. To our viewers, if you ever, I think I think wine pairings are great if they are offered by fancy restaurants. Um, especially, well, even if you don't know your stuff, mm-hmm. because most restaurants that have a wine pairing program will have done extensive research into what wines blend well with the stuff you are going to eat. And you may only be getting like, what, a three ounce pour or something? Yep, that, yeah. But you're going to be getting like five to eight. Five to eight dishes. And, and wines. One wines. Yeah. Paired with it. So that's, Which a, that's in, a fair amount of alcohol. That's a drink. fair amount of alcohol. To drink. Yes. So I am a big supporter of wine pairings. For one part, the classiness, 
on the other part because I am part alcoholic, probably. So and the fact that you know chefs put a lot of thought into the menu, and so sommeliers should put a lot of thought into what goes with. And menu. the chefs do work with the sommeliers; they taste the wine and the food. Yeah. So you're looking at refined palates working together to give the customer the most the number one experience experience they can. And that's what it boils down to. For that. Our first course is Sar Nicolai Resort Caviar, Spring Onion and Almond Buffalo. It's a nice opening course with complex flavors. The first that's from the pairing is a So Spring Onion, Caviar. Uh, if I remember correctly about this place, they are Big on like the vegetarian, but their number one meat will be lamb, I believe. So, lamba? eat the lamb. Uh, they are very big on like the name quince, which just it's named after like a fruit or vegetable. It's the forbidden fruit that yeah. you know you took a bite of. Yeah, you know, not a honey crisp apple. No, no. that's just whitewashing Bible, but yeah, uh, quince, amazing flavor profile and all that but the spring onion with the caviar you're gonna get the, the you have the saltiness of the caviar but the nice bite the, the nice, nice bite the nice fresh earthiness bite of the spring onion the spring so onion. it should be a great combination together when i think of spring onion i think of something being clean yeah you know what i'm saying it's a a refresher in your mouth it's like it's an opening palate cleanser almost. Yes. It's like I use it in like fried rice and all that. It's beautiful in fried rice. It's like, so it, it contrasts well with against oil, against salt, you know. So that's how I would use it. Yep. The Morgan 2017 Sauvignon Blanc from the northern part of Burgundy. It's light and refreshing thanks to producers Alice and Olivier de Moore. It's paired with our green asparagus mm. cooked in spring mustard broth, fried egg and caviar. Removing the asparagus wasn't an easy task, but the server managed. The texture is so good, I couldn't get it. That, that's a scotch egg. That is a scotch egg. Yeah. It's a beautiful scotch egg. It's soft with some firmness to it. With caviar and in sauces, it. Sauces, caviar, and egg. My goodness. This okay, the only way they could have done that is, is to freeze the egg. Yeah. So you're using frozen unless, eggs? I uh, know. So unless they... Uh, so unless they actually like they bread the egg they cut it and then they scoop out the yolk place in the caviar and spoon in the sauce okay how do you deep fry the egg you got to... no i know you, you, you deep fry the you egg. deep fry it you cut it and then you take it out yes yes yes, yes. that's what i mean sorry but it's a beautiful plate once again oh. so far, big on caviar is elegant time for a new Sauvignon Blanc. This time is a 2010 Blanc de Fumé de Bouy from the Loire Valley. It's dry and smoky with lovely honey and green pepper. It was a huge surprise to experience such a wine. Going with it is our next course. Spring peas, lightly warmed, tomatoes baked lamb and guanciale. Guanciale is a type of Italian cured meat Chichi. made from pork cheeks. It gives the dish a warm That's umami. It. Another strong course. Our next wine catches me off guard. It's a mascot from the border of France and Spain mm. from French producer Matassa. This cuvee has loads of mango and has an amazing color. This is not the kind of natural wine I have had before. Natural wine is made with minimal intervention in both the vineyard and the winery. It starts with the soil, where no chemicals are used, and the vineyard is treated as an interconnected ecosystem. Some natural wine producers even use the lunar calendar to decide when to do what. The grapes are most often harvested by hand, and the natural fermentation process happens without using added yeast. It's also unfiltered and unrefined, which gives it a cloudy look. The philosophy behind it is to create a wine that is a true expression of the grape, the vineyard, the vintage, without industrial methods to shape its character. So essentially, organic wine. Truly. Like organic it's from like the sense, minimalist. Yeah, you you don't want to do it as, as little as possible, and let nature give you what it wants to give you. Yeah, you know that that's how I do my gardening too. So it's like I I love this concept. I love this, you know, how it plays towards the food. I I know? love that we're starting to 
see that a lot more like let nature do its job like it's giving you the best product already it's it's already there and and then i love the simple like why food philosophy is simple yeah and it's hard to do simple and the fact that you could do little as little as possible to it and still come up with a great product i love that in some cases, the result is a vibrant flavor that is said to be more expressive of the terroir. The matasa is joined by our next course, Pine Glen Creek White Nettle Velute. It's fresh, <laughs> deep, and rich. Soup. Crisp, refined, and gorgeous flavors. I really like this. The restaurant continues to impress with the wine, the tasting menu. I, I just gotta say, with this whole supermarket, Food's easy to come by, culture that we live in. It's a lot of things that are perceived to be weeds or pests or things are just so beautiful to They are. You know? And wild nettle is phenomenal. It's like pick a dandelion as long as there's no freaking chemicals around it. Exactly. Nice bit of green to it. It's just like if you do some more research on it, maybe I'll do a food series on it. A couple of videos of like just what I can get out of my garden. It's very simple. It's and it's abundant. Yeah. And the fact that you not to put foreign non-native plants around to get a good meal is amazing. Yeah. But yeah, props to them for using this. And that itself is a growing trend in the Michelin kitchens, like using natural products, simple, simple products. And that is actually part and no waste either. No waste, uh, yes. They recently introduced into the Michelin cook, into the Michelin guide, the green star. So mm. if a restaurant has a green star, it means it had, it should have like almost zero waste. Zero waste. And you have to keep in mind the deliveries, like how far are these things yeah. are, right? Using so every like, every bit of the product. Yeah. So props to them, props for the innovation, props to sustainability. In, and this wonderful interior, it feels good to be here. It is a beautiful The flavors interior. are beautiful and the dishes are sophisticated. Each one comes with different cutlery <laughs> and the glass That's selection amazing. is also very nice. The next wine selection is from Sicily. It's called Soki Soki from producer Tankanika. I just gotta make a comment on glass selection here because that makes a huge difference in how you perceive wine yes. and taste wine. And it's little things like that that elevate your dynamics. And it's imagine the research that needs to be done for even just the simplest glass of wine. That's the thing, you know. And Props to them knowing how much to pour in that. Pinky Bimbo grapes. I'm generally not a fan of natural wines, unless they are amazing as this. It's partnered with Hokkaido Sea Urchin Risotto with passion fruit. I saw this on the Alakan huh. menu and was curious and had to try it. It added about 100 euros to the bill, but was so worth it. The presentation isn't in line with the rest, but it makes up for it with rich, savory flavor. Thoughts on that? It looked good, it looked plain, but the fact that you can make it look so, that you can make it taste so good without the addition of truffles, caviar, and like literally five pieces of, six pieces of uni is, and it has to be high quality uni as well. Uh, I'm weirded out by the passion fruit. Yes. In the risotto. Don't call me. Don't come by my house. We're done. And it's like, it, it, it seemed forced to me. But yeah. There's a seat at the chef's table. Here we get up close and personal to traditional cooking. And we get the chance to meet the chef, Michael Tusk. While studying art history in university, he took his first cooking job and fell in love. After that, he went straight to the Culinary Institute of America in New York. And then got experience in France and Italy, where his time in the Barbaresco region had a big effect on him. To this day, he's a strong believer of materia prima, the Italian term for working with the best possible raw materials. 
In 1988, he returned to the Bay Area. He worked at the legendary Stars restaurant before moving to Shepanis for four years. From there, he joined Chef Paul Bertoli at Olivetto. And after six years there, he started looking for the perfect location for his own restaurant. In 2003, he and his wife Lindsay found a place in the Pacific Heights and opened Quince, an Italian-inspired restaurant that made the most of Northern California produce. In 2007, they got the first mission star before moving Quince. Like the plating of the early not the early 2000s, like via and like just all. How different it is compared to oh, today. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Even the choice of plate. Yeah, like the choice of plate, the fact that it's like a clump and like you have the literally the leaves of arugula like dotted around the plate and like the cut cherry tomato. That today is like faux pas. Yeah. Yeah, that's, like that's it's, just old. It's old school. No. And then, but this is like the stuff that inspired me as a kid watching this on like Iron Chef Japan. Mm -hmm. A stark difference between then and the tight tweezer plating of today. Yeah, where it's mostly empty space. Yep, the it's negative the, space. It's like 90% negative space on a huge plate. Yeah, this is more this like, is, this, this is, is like, home style. This is home stone fine dining. Yeah. 2007, they got the first mission stop before moving Queens to its current location in Jackson Heights. In 2014 came the second star, in 2017 the third, and in 2020 they were one of the first to get the Michelin Green Star. Next to Queens are two other Tusk properties. One is the Queens Bar and Salon, on the other side is the sister restaurant called Cotonia. The kitchen has a steady stream of fruits, vegetables and flowers from the big round farm. As if they weren't busy enough, in 2020 Chef and his wife started a non-profit called Feed the Future. Now, in 2024, Chef Tusk finds himself in new territory, the California court. Fighting to protect the name and defend the reputation, it took him over 20 years to build. Against a new online startup also using the Queen's name. In the lawsuit, the restaurant claims that the online company's use of the name Queen's creates brand confusion and damages their reputation. Making things worse, shopper complaints for the online company went to the Better Business Bureau under the restaurant's name. But for Chef Tusk, the last show came when the retailer added kitchen goods to its website and called them Michelin Worthy Cookware. It prompted Chef Tusk to file a lawsuit, seeking a That's. Oh my god. You don't know how many hours, how much pain and suffering. You have to go through to get those stars. That's just horrible, bad luck. You know, like to start an online store and say, "Oh yeah, this guy, this guy is Michelin." This guy, if we use his name and we say Michelin cookware, it's like they're gonna eat it up because people are gonna think it's from the Michelin star restaurant. Yeah, it's like the same company. <laughs> wow, it's. Wow. Control of the Queen's name, plus half the damages, to the tune of $12 million. What's next? Watch to the end to find out. And now, back to the chef's table. Our wine here is a 2001 Riesling from the Sierra Food Spears. It's called Once Upon a Time by producer Flo Sarone. It's matched with a white asparagus portalini in fermented white asparagus sauce. Amazing dish and the sauce was exceptional. The, the fact white. that we could sit in the kitchen and eat this was both wonderful and fascinating. You get to see up close the quality and beauty of everything, even the serving trays. Our next wine is an Italian red. It's a 2021 from the Cerasuolo d'Abruzzo region in central Italy. It's a Montepulciano, but it's not to be confused with the place of the same name in southern Tuscany. It comes with this West Marine black cod wrapped in chanterelle mushrooms and fresh chard and topped with garlic scape and smothered in green jam. When the sauce was poured, it felt like something from the Red Chart collection. I think I saw an angel in there. <laughs> Getting ready for the main course, we have a range of international cutlery. A butter knife from Japan, a mini cleaver from California and a fork from Germany. For main course, we have a 1987 bottle of Chapelet Signature Cabernet Sauvignon. 
This is from Napa Valley and has been perfected over the last 15 years. It beautifully concentrated with flavors of blackberry out. and toasted oak. What's better than a nice vintage wine? Two nice vintage wines. This is the 95 Cabernet Sauvignon wow. from the producer we saw earlier, Claude Sarone. The bottle. Number 25 of 51 Magnums. Only 51 Magnum bottles were made. That's two per, that is 2% like of the entire collection in his hand. That's amazing to me. Absolutely. Like, wow. His value is limited. Yeah. Scarcity. And for like a 1995 as well, like, I guess they had to like update the, the uh, label. Cause like, I would have not thought they would have had a website or anything in 1995. It's obviously an updated label, I'm guessing. But well, that's when the, that's when the grapes were harvested. Yes. Right. Maybe not when it was bottled. Correct. My apologies. So yeah. And you know, for the producer we saw earlier, Claude Sarrell. It's great to compare these two Cabernets from different years and from different areas of California. And now, the main course. Don Watson spring lamb cooked in the fireplace with a salad of fava, so spring correct. garlic, and roasted white spring onion. We saw this on the spit More on the spring onion. Here we have different so cuts available. of meat. This was intense. With main course is done, cheese is next. But first, two wines to go with it. One is nearly 100 years old. It's a 1929 Madeira from the Oliveiras. They are an independent Madeira wine producer. Once again, guys, take the wine pairing. Do you know how expensive a glass of 100-year-old wine would be? Like, uh, even a glass. They wouldn't do it by glass. Five dollars. Six dollars. Like, amazing. Not confused. Amazing. Because, like, good lord. And Madeira is a very full-bodied yes. wine. Yes. It's, it's very overpowering, and you could only pair it with the cheese. So yeah, big strong cheese. Producer on the island's south coast. This dessert wine is luscious and sticky sweet. It looked like balsamic vinegar coming out of there. <laughs> like that's how, like it's thick, it's aged, it's good. It, it's strong. It's overpowering. The other is a 1962 Gallinara. It's a bone dry Nebbiolo from the Piedmont region of Italy. Two wines, two completely that, different that's profiles. That's more on the drier side. Our cheese yeah. selection is a mix of local and imported cheese. This is not included with the tasting menu, but we added it for 35 euros. Now it's time so for So 70 bucks course. for that. This part of the menu is cheese. thanks to the pastry mm -hmm. chef, Sham Gao. His first creation is ginger barb, sorrel, and ginger. Beautiful it's a beautiful looking. mix of flavor, from tangy to sweet. For our Speaks next dessert, we are sale. on the move. Next door, the Queen's Bar and Salon. It's a slightly more relaxed version of Queen's and does not require a reservation. I am obsessed with this space. The fixtures, the artwork, this part of the tasting menu? It's dessert, dessert, yeah. It's a mix Do of you... Nordic and Japanese. I, I, with yeah. spaces that I, f make. I find it very weird that they would move you to the restaurant next door for dessert, but I don't know. Like, That's new. That's I'm not sure how that is. Yeah. But even mm. then, like, even if it's not part of the plan, the fact that they make it look so effortless and planned, like... I, I kind of dig it. I, uh, that has to be confusing as hell, though. It, like, it wouldn't work in any other restaurant no. setting. Fine, fine dining, Michelin star is the only place it would work. Agreed. You know, because mm. <laughs> you get people walking out as, at dessert, and without without to, paying the bill, you expect them to come back. It's one thing, you know what I'm saying? Especially in San Francisco, <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah. It's really inviting. It feels like someone's elegant. Mm -hmm. Our last wine of the evening is a sparkling rosé from Bougie Cerdon in France. It's a combination of red grapes of the Beaujolais nice and Jura regions. It's semi sweet champagne. and has a bright mm -hmm. grapey flavor. Next in the sweet lineup is warm rhubarb, strawberry, wow. and bronte pistachio tart. Here we see tangy and sweet again, but this time it's joined by the nutty pistachio. Continuing the tour, we arrive at one of my favorite places, the wine cellar. <laughs> it's magnificent. Wow. 10,000 bottles, 2,500 unique selections, 
and they even decorate fresh flowers every day. To finish things off, we have a selection of bumblebees. And that will do it for today. Our total is around 2000 euros for two. So what's next for Chef Tusk in his battle for the Queen's name? While we are making this video, a judge will decide whether to dismiss the case or bring it to a jury trial. Chef, I hope that Lady Justice sides with you. No matter what happens in the case, I think one thing is for sure. Queen's, the restaurant, will continue to serve the best Italian-inspired Californian cuisine with high-quality, locally-grown, organic ingredients, where the service is elegant, refined and friendly and the stunning interior creates an inviting atmosphere that will make you want to stay. Thus, you know what? I, I'm i glad I saw this. Um, it's a very clickbaity title with like the whole lawsuit and all that. Mm -hmm, the problem I, again. I think like, I hope they win the lawsuit. I feel like, I, I do feel bad for them because especially if they have to change their name, that would technically take away all the stars right they'd have to start fresh under a new name right mm, yeah well it i don't think they'll have to change the name i think it would just be the website gets to keep their name yes and the fact that you know they're selling cookware with michelin quality but i think it's also partially it could also be partially a business mistake because what's the first thing a lot of businesses do is they trademark a name well, you could trademark a name, you could copyright a name, but it's you have to fight for that trademark. Yeah. You have to fight for that copyright. Yeah. You know, it's like same thing with patents. So if you're an inventor out there, you could patent something, but you have to fight for that patent. You have to, there's certain steps you have to do. Mm -hmm. And hopefully these guys did the, these steps. But going back to the food, like hopefully they win the blood. Hopefully they win the thing. The food, like, the food, beautiful, clean. Uh, the plates, the cutlery, the wine, like you were saying, the wine glass, like you were saying, all immaculately, like selected for the specific thing. Um, I didn't like the asparagus. The, the I the I agree. I think like I think that was just just was, making a, making an asparagus tea at the at the table. Yeah, it it felt like oh, we had to do some kind of Russian service because we're Michelin star and like have some movement with with the waiter at the table side. It felt forced, like totally unnecessary and like you said it was very janky. Yes. Right? It wasn't executed smoothly, so it's just like mm. I was a big fan of that risotto. That in like a little cast iron as a side for something would be amazing. Yeah, but, but to add a, uh, what was it, hundred bucks? Hundred bucks to a menu yeah, so. for when I feel the six pieces of uni covering costs. Like we don't know the stock that was used. We don't know the the other True. stuff in it. it. It didn't feel right with the whole pairing. That's why I wasn't. I agree. With the, That's with why the it wasn't menu. with the pairing, though. Yeah. And the fact that the yeah, added when they did just because it looked interesting. More power to you, but. It, it didn't seem right. It seemed like, well, what's Asian? Like Which is what, weird because he's done a lot of his stuff in Europe, in France. So. Yeah. And it's like, and it's an Italian based fine dining, yeah. right? So Which I like, get with like risotto being Italian and all that, but adding the uni, like. Uni and the pieces when, of nori in there. I'm just I like, feel like if you were going for Italian American, you could have done like a beautiful morel or even the white Ooh. asparagus as Ooh, well in, yeah. the, in the risotto you know we'll play what's what's in your garden yeah here, you know it's just like uh, it's like you have caviar and everything is that's great for, for the uni and caviar it's fucking perfect. the scotch egg was beautiful oh i love the scotch egg that was amazing it's like that thin cross of scotch egg on there Wow. And the fact that somebody jumped on their name, the fact that it was available on the website might hinder the lawsuit. I agree. You know, I feel like it's going to get thrown out. Because like, but the fact that they're selling, there used to be a clothing store, but then it's like, now they're selling cookware. 
which is probably like a Le Creuset ripoff. Yeah, and they're saying Michelin. And which is not something you just throw around. Yeah, yeah and, and the fact that like they're obviously capitalizing on their success. Changing of the, the seats and all that. I like the idea of the chef's table. Yeah. Um, I want to know if there is if they do specific research into their clients beforehand to determine who gets to sit at the set the chef's table and when. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of three Michelin star places now, Eleven Madison Park started here, I believe. They have a full time position there of someone who just looks at everyone on the reservation and finds every kind of social media profile they have to go over like what they like, what their dreams are and all that. It's a dream planner essentially. That's the position title, I believe. And how to mold their visit to the restaurant around what they like. That's pretty cool. It's like, what, you, you hear the term going the extra mile, like they're running an extra marathon for these people who mm. don't even know it sometimes. Yeah, that's so cool. You know, I like what they did in the bear sometimes. And that one episode where they had that dream time. And like, and you know the what? Deep dish pizza. And you know what? This meal's on us, guys. Yeah. We're not we're not dropping a check on this table. It's like that's cool. You guys you know? it's like especially with that, I remember that scene. It's like their school teachers, they've saved up for this. Like, we're gonna make it worth their while. Like, like the, this is their dream to have vicious fun. It's like because you know what? Three hundred and ninety dollars. That's that's just before the, tasting, the wine. You know? That's before the add ons. That's before like tax and tip i was like and it's out of reach for most people it's out of reach for me yeah you know what i'm saying and the only way i know about this food is because i've been behind the scenes of this food that's the only way i got to taste the, the wagyu the shark fin soup the the white truffles in season you know yeah it's like because you were there you were the one handling the material <laughs> i was on, you know putting it on it's like but the only way I got to taste good food was like making this good food. And, food. and that was also like grinding to get there as well. Like yeah. being able to be in that position, you have to work hard because there are multitudes of people banging at the door to take your spot. Well, yeah, and just to work my way up, my way up to that position of trust. Oh yeah, by the way, here, here's $500 worth of truffles, you know? Take care of this. Yep. It's like, okay, thanks. You know. But yeah. But that being said, another great video. Another great video. Um, I I'll look into finding the one where it was the guy eating everything on the menu. There. Now keep in mind, from what I know, this menu changes like every five, four or five months. So mm-hmm. it'll be a completely different menu, but it'll still be really good. Yeah, the experience they went through. Yeah. Yeah, and it'll be good to see it from a normal person's perspective a non-foodie a non-foodie yes so mm-hmm. hopefully you'll be there with us uh we thank you for sticking with us through this video yeah if you just hit the subscribe and that noti bell it's like what we uploaded you'll, you'll know about you'll know so you know? so then you'll watch that and then you comment down below like i watched that video yeah you know that works out for us let us know like let us know what you guys want to see as well we appreciate you guys we love you guys yeah be kind to you be kind to others and have a great day guys love you love you